Innovation and creativity are central to entrepreneurship. But what happens when you go beyond the edge? The Frontier Entrepreneurship Podcast brings you the world's first, the disruptive, the avant-garde. We take you to the frontier in conversation with the entrepreneurs who are the forerunners of the industries of the future. Get to know their world with co-hosts Braden Kemp and Tracy Morningstar. Imagine the late night glow of a laser cutter, the whir of a CNC, along with the additive repetitions of a 3D printer. It's a coordinated machine shop running 24-7 entirely on its own. Today, we're taking you to the frontiers of industrial automation with Zap Metals, a robotics startup bringing next generation prototyping to the world. Braden Kemp with my co-host Tracy Morningstar. Very nice to be here today. Our guest today is Osafat Khan, Chief Technical Officer at Zap Metals, and he's taking us to the frontier of industrial automation with his vision for a fully autonomous machine shop. And I'm excited to talk to you today because I was recently involved in a startup uh, that had to prototype designs in aluminum. I found it was slow and incredibly labor intensive, and I'm guessing I'm going to learn uh, all about how we were doing it wrong today which is great. Um, Your vision combines the efficient world of automation with what seems to be a pretty tedious world of prototyping, short-run manufacturing. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about where the company is now and and what your vision for the future is? Hey, thanks for having me on. Yes, to give you a background about what we're working on and stage we're currently at, we our, our, pretty much our goal is to have a fully autonomous CNC milling shop and then eventually expand on to things like sheet metal and you know, other types of, of metal manufacturing, subtractive so manufacturing. We're currently uh, doing two things. We're in the very early stages of product development. So we've already created our MVP and have been testing that occasionally throughout customer orders. So along with that, we are actually running a traditional machine shop right now. So some parts can be done autonomously and most of them actually right now are being done in traditional mes- methods. So uh, regular operators operating the machine. So we're doing a lot of learning on how the current industry works so we can take our technology and implement it really quickly when we're ready to do so. Very cool. And you mentioned an MVP. So I guess the core of, uh, call it the secret sauce of Zap Metals will be this technology that you're you're developing. Um what does the MVP look like? What is its functionality? Yeah, so currently the MVP is a robot arm on a platform that can operate, so that can pick up a block of material and place it in the machine in a custom design cloud. So a lot of the, the smaller hardware pieces here are proprietary custom designs. So like the end effectors to pick up the blocks are custom designed and the clamps are custom designed. We, we designed these ourselves so we can uh, have better autonomy and, uh, and better automation in general. We, we just found some of the stuff on the market was either really expensive or not that great for what we want to do. But the, the current stage, we are able to fully autonomously find a block within a certain uh, work area and place it in a machine and start cutting that t- block fully autonomously. Fantastic. Yeah, so as as we start to as we continue to build our MVP, we're gonna start adding functionality like uh slipping blocks in the machine. So that's called refixturing and removing the cut parts as well. So it's uh we, we have a three stage process to our, our MVP and we have completed our, our first stage. Very cool. Well, Seth, you had talked about upgrading of the machine that you're gonna be using. How is that happening? Yeah, we're actually doing everything in-house. All of our design work, everything we are doing is all within our own team. We're not outsourcing much. We have tried to look at things that we can buy off the shelf. So things like robot arms and CNC machines. Those we are using other people to help us uh, find, source, and and get uh, the machines that we need. We don't really plan on on making those in-house. We just think that the stuff on the market is is good enough for, for what we need. Perhaps we should step back for a second. We're talking about 
uh, prototyping and manufacturing. I think for anyone who doesn't work in that space, uh, it's maybe a bit of a mystery or a black box. Can you explain the process of, you know, taking an idea from a customer's brain and turning it into a functional part? Yeah, it's actually a question we get very often because a lot of people don't actually deal with manufacturing on a regular basis. So let's say, for example, you have a cup that you want to make uh, out of metal for whatever reason. Uh, what you would have to start off with is a 3D model of this cup that you want to make, so like a, a drinking glass. And that 3D model will be sent to manufacturers, whether you want it done locally, overseas, wherever. There's two kind of ways people are, are contacting manufacturers right now one is through online platforms where you can upload a part and you get a quote back within a specific amount of time and the second is just through emailing people and i think that's the most common method right now you just email your local machine shop and they get your quote as soon as they can uh, after you send the the part or the 3d model out the machinist or the the manufacturer will determine the cost based off of material cost and how long it would take to actually cut the part and uh, this can take uh, between a day to a week. We've actually had some calls take two to three weeks to, to come in. So it's not a fast process right now. It does, it does take quite a bit of time still. And uh, once that is done, uh, the manufacturer will send a quote back with pricing and lead time to the, to the client. And they can decide to go through with the order or not. If they do decide to go through, the process starts of the, uh, the machinists will have to get a block of material they will program the machine to actually cut out the material that isn't needed from that block of material. And this is uh, this can be slow depending on the material use. Like if you use aluminum, it'll be pretty quick. But if you're trying to use materials like 316 or or, or even things like Inconel, it starts to take a long time to, to cut these parts. So once the programming is done, the machinist will then get the block of material and a measure and make sure it's all correct to size is in square and put it in the machine and uh, make sure the part is completely square to the end mill on the machine so to the to the part that actually cuts the the metal it needs to be to a certain tolerance based off of that position and then that's when the, the cutting process starts but once that is done the operator will remove the part and do inspection through tools like a caliber uh, or something called CMM, which is a a really fancy way of measuring a really high tolerance parts. And if everything is in spec, they'll then uh, send the part back to the client, and uh, that the client can can use that part. How much of that can you automate? Our goal is to automate pretty much ninety nine percent of that. There's some parts that don't really make sense to automate, like uh, shipping a part out. It uh, doesn't really make sense for us to make entire system just to put a block in a box, package it, and, and all that. Uh, what our primary goal is is to automate the parts that take the most amount of time and obviously will cost the most in human labor, which right now we believe is the actual uh, loading and unloading of machines, so the part handling aspect of it. So anything with the machine and the block that the human has to do, we want to to automate that part. Very cool. You talked a little bit about the cutting process. What's doing the cutting? Yeah, it's, so imagine a drill bit. So something you use to drill regular holes. So something very similar to that. Uh, it's more of a rectangular shape than it is. Uh, so the bottom is more of a rectangular than a, a cone. And what it does is that it's a, it's a pretty much a drill that goes in a three-dimensional space and can cut material away from a block. Instead of uh, like three pinter will melt plastic and and add it layer by layer, a CNC machine will remove material layer by layer to get the part that you want. Are you doing any three D printing in in the process as well, or just uh, strictly CNC machines? We are starting off a CNC machine because we think that's kind of an industry that's been underserved, especially for small runs, so like one to ten parts or one to hundred parts. There's not a lot of people who like making those kind of parts. So we found that there's a big a gap in the market for these small run parts. We we do hope to expand to 3D printing services as well as we grow. I think that's very far down the line. It's interesting you mentioned that in the short run parts. That, that's something that we found that we had to, um, uh, we had to actually buy some small scale CNC machines to, to accomplish what we wanted to. Um, 
short runs, you know, one, two, three versions of something that, that wasn't something that uh, a lot of shops wanted to take on. Yeah, it's kind of it's, it's kind of crazy how few shops actually want to do it. We actually did a study uh, earlier when we first started in December 2022, and we sent out a quote to 300 machine shops throughout uh, Canada, US, and China to see who wants to make the parts and what prices we get back. And then I don't remember the exact number, but I think it was like 8% of US machine shops actually replied to us, and we had a, a quantity of one of, the, of each part. So not many people actually want to take on these small run orders, even though they are very critical to uh, especially startups and, and hardware companies that need to do prototyping. Did you did you take on that? Uh, like, was that a business ideation exercise? Were you, were you trying to evaluate if there was a market for it? Or was it just sort of something that happened and you went, ah, aha, there's an opportunity there? Yeah, it just, that was purposefully for market validation to see where there is a gap and, and see what the pricing is really. Our main goal was to find out who wants to do these parts as more to see how much these parts cost compared to mass production. And as you can imagine, it's very expensive to make one-off parts than it is to make a thousand of, of a single part. When sourcing out your metals, is that going to be an uh, issue down the road or have you been able to source out the metals that are required? Yeah, we actually have a really good metal supply right now. They have most of the stuff we've needed so far. Uh, it's really good for us because they're very close to our shop and they we don't have to stock material in-house, which uh, makes our cost much lower and it's much easier for us to, to, to get parts out the door faster. That's because if we have a supplier that stocks material for us, it, we would just have such a big uh, variety of, of material to choose from. Yeah, you had mentioned that there's going to be more options down the line. Is it because you're sourcing out more materials? Partially. So the bigger we get, the more materials we can actually offer. But the the main goal is to first, we want to enter the market in a very specific area. We don't want to go and try to grab the entire market all at once. We want to get to something that we know it is the easiest, not really necessarily easiest, but has the biggest problem to get into, the most difficulty in and the least amount of innovation in the space, which we found out was the small run CNC milling. So that's why you want to enter that market first. And as we grow, we can start expanding material availability and different types of manufacturing processes. Great. I, I want to jump back to your technology side a little bit. Um, I mentioned at the start, I have a tiny bit of experience in, in prototyping, specifically with 3D printers and CNC mills. And my nightmare was always leaving at the end of the day and hoping that I didn't come back to either complete destruction or a 3D print that looks like a spaghetti factory exploded. Is there a technology that you guys are working on that kind of babysit that process while someone is not there staring at it? Yeah, that is one of the biggest issues we've seen, especially right now as we're running a traditional machine shop. We, I'm the one who's machining these parts myself, so I'm firsthand experiencing what the issues are in the space. And for example, we have an order from an automotive company that we're working on, and it took me about half an hour to do the programming for it, but it took me 20 hours of just standing in front of the machine and, and, and just watching it, making sure nothing messes up. So that is a huge cost right there of 20 hours of, of labor time to, to wash this machine. Uh, we have an idea and we're currently working on a way to monitor these machines through different types of sensors, vibration, cameras, all these types of different things to, to make sure that these machines can operate fully autonomously without having someone stand there and wash it. I'm glad to hear that I wasn't the only one standing in front of the scene saying, well, st staring at it to make sure it wasn't going to screw up. Yeah, I think everyone does it. And how unique is that in the in the marketplace? Are, are are other shops trying to do that? Do you see an opportunity to commercialize that technology outside of your own shop uh, into the market? Yeah, I think there is a there are, there are a few companies doing some aspects of this, but not all of it. So it's the, I don't remember the names of them, but there are companies uh, detecting creating sensors detect something called chatter. The chatter is when a material isn't cutting correctly. So it makes a very specific vibration and, and noise that uh, humans could pick up on really easily, but it's not very easy for for machines to pick up on. So there's companies working on creating sensors for that. But on a 
overall view, there isn't a company that we know of that's doing a all-in-one system where you can just press a button, start the machine and just walk away and, and it'll detect everything on the machine in terms of if everything's cutting in tolerance or if it's if it's just chatter going on, if something's wrong with the, the machine. That's kind of where we have a, a differentiation between our competitors and also in the fact that our main differentiation between current robot arms that can automate machines and what we are, de are developing is ability to pick up and rotate uh, pieces that are that are being cut and putting them back into the lab. So that's kind of the big difficult part of this automation process is, is refixturing and not many people are able to do that very well. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a technical and and sort of challenging thing to do manually. Uh, I mean, yeah. It's tricky to train the computer to do it. Yeah, it's not the easiest task to, to be working on. Yeah, also, uh, what does a team at Zap Metals comprise of? Yeah, we actually have a very small team right now. It's a team of two. So it's my co-founder and I, uh, Ian, he's the CEO and he's doing, uh, he's focusing on just developing the business further and talking to clients, getting more clients and just learning where the pain points are for our customers. And uh, my aspect is to develop the technology behind solving these pain points for our customers, but also figuring out what the pain points are for the machinists and seeing how to figure out uh, how to make their lives easier and, and better. Uh, we, yeah, so we have two different aspects there. We're, we're quite separate in terms of what we do, but we do talk a lot about technology together and how we, how we can grow our business, different opportunities on on where we can expand and and grow to. What? How how would you build that team for the future of Zap Metals? Yeah, there's obviously the tech side is where we do most of the hiring. We need to be able to, 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 to develop a fully autonomous system for manufacturing is a pretty big task to take on. Expect to take a, a large team and a lot of time to actually get to a point of full autonomy. But what we actually learned from our customer discovery so far is that our clients actually really like the human interaction and many of them will choose to pay a little bit more just so they can have a machinist or a person to talk to rather than uploading a part on the website. So we do want to expand the team to have really good sales team as well that can actually interact and have a personal relationship with our, our clients. Because it seems like clients really enjoy that one-on-one -on -one interaction we have with them. You mentioned that the automation is where the bulk of the team will be focused. Is there an opportunity to uh, like repurpose automation uh, components, whether they're mechanical or, or software from other industries. So for example, we see a lot of automation happening in agriculture right now. It can be similarly, uh, it, it can require precision, but dealing with larger items. Can you repurpose some of that stuff or are you building everything from scratch? Yeah, we can actually repurpose a lot of it. And we are using open source uh, libraries and, and all that, that is used for these different types of technology is already on the market. But one of our biggest issues is that, like for agriculture, for example, you're dealing with fruits, vegetables that are that have color. They're, they're e fairly easy to identify a, a green pepper versus a orange. But when you have a reflective surface like what we're dealing with, we have pretty much a mirror that we're, we're trying to detect. It gets very difficult and there isn't a lot on the market already that can be used to detect reflective features and reflective surfaces. So for example, if you have a mirror surface and you cut out a circle in the center of it, how would a system know that it's a circle there? And that's kind of where a, a lot of difficulty comes in, in terms of what we're trying to do. Uh, we There are a few different types of sensors we are looking at that are available on the market that we can use to uh, detect these surfaces. But as of right now, as far as we know, there aren't any off the shelf products we can use to do exactly what we want to do. I love that analogy with the, the pepper and the <laughs> orange. It's not something I would have considered, but yeah, yeah. you say it and you're looking at a you know flat piece of metal on a metal table. There's no yeah. differentiation there to pick up on. Yeah. And, and what a lot of these uh, sensors that agriculture companies are just, it, it, these computer vision companies in general are using are either pictures or they're laser 
uh, or light scanners. Mm -hmm. And when you have laser or light, this is going to reflect off the surface. So it just makes it more difficult to, to detect these types of surfaces. Very interesting. As I was looking over some of your favorite book, uh, you had said that Modern Control Systems was a book that you enjoyed. And oh, yeah, a great book. I did, yeah, I did take a look at, look at it, and uh, it talked about green engineering. Could you talk a little bit about that, and is that something that your business is actually going to evolve into? Yeah, a, a pretty large aspect, especially something that my co-founder really is keen on, is improving the environment in general, making green technology, helping improve our uh, clean technology sector. One thing that I personally have a really strong opinion on is the reduction in CO2 emissions when you start making stuff locally rather than overseas. So if we have a part that weighs 100 pounds and we're shipping that to f from overseas to Canada, that's a, a lot of weight to be shipping over the half across the world. So what we what 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 our, what one of our missions is is to make manufacturing more affordable in in North America to a point where a lot of people who would be ordering stuff in overseas countries would rather spend a few dollars more to make them here in Canada and reduce those emissions. So we we do believe that a big portion of the company is to help not only clean tech companies make their stuff in North America and for cheap and quick, but also to take other companies that are typically manufacturing stuff overseas and start bringing that onshore to reduce those emissions. That's, that's a noble mission, but I want to go back and highlight that um, we've never had anyone answer that favorite book question with a textbook before. <laughs> yeah. So we might need to introduce you to the fiction section. Yeah, <laughs> I've been, uh, yes, the, the professor that actually introduced me to that textbook, he, he used it for his course, a really good professor, Dr. Carlos Rosa, he, uh, this, 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 the stuff he taught was, it was great. And it really got me into the control systems industry, like starting to do programming on autonomous robots and all that. So that was, uh, it's, a, it's a book textbook I refer to quite a bit to uh, figure out how to do different types of, of control systems stuff. Awesome. And, and the, while we're on the topic of your background, I hear you've worked at a couple of startups and previously started a company around the concept of an autonomous snowblower, which I think yeah. is an innovation that all of Canada can get behind. Um, I, I imagine as a mechatronics engineer, there's like a, a you know reasonably clear cut path to you know, a secure and, and lucrative career. Why start companies instead? I think for me personally, it's the desire to actually work on something I truly believe in and, and actually enjoy working on. I'm sure there is a lot of people hiring for mechatronics engineers, but the, some of the stuff uh, I've worked on in the past just didn't truly resonate to what I believe I should be working on. And what I'm working on now is something I've, I've been uh, thinking about for a long time. How do we improve manufacturing in North America and try to bring some of that back here? Uh, but... Yeah, so I worked at uh, like working on the Thomas Snowblower was something actually I I truly believed in as well, but uh, a lot of people don't seem to actually want a autonomous snowblower. It's a cool idea, but it doesn't seem like the demand is actually there to be a massive company that there. would be able to sustain itself. Do you think? Um, so I, I guess in general, I love the story of starting a second company. I've had a couple of businesses myself, and I find that. The second time around, you just feel infinitely more prepared. Do you think you picked up a lot of learning in in that endeavor that you're you know putting to use now with Zap Metals? Oh yeah, hundred percent. There's there's so much stuff that I learned from that first company that I was able to bring into the second one and just skip a lot of headache and, and pain. And some of the big stuff was just figuring out how to take on uh, tech projects and how to just manage. A, a large scale project like, like we're working on here. One of the biggest issues we had back when I started the Thomas Snowblower Company was that we were we we're talking to people before we were ready to talk to people. So for example, investors or, or strategic partners, we were talking to them at a stage where we weren't able to really show what we wanted to show to them and, and actually get the, the response that we wanted. So if you already go in and 
and you, you're not proving yourself in this first few meetings and you're you're going to be set back when you try to meet them again later on that's one of the big things that we we I took into account for for this company where we don't want to go and start showing our technology to people before it's ready to be shown so that's that's uh it's taking a bit slower than we we did before yeah i can see the progression in in that market validation exercise that you talked about earlier yeah we want to make sure that we're ready before we go and be told we're not ready yeah makes sense i think that's great advice in general for entrepreneurs yeah, a lot of people get excited and it's like, hey, we got this cool, cool new technology. I just want to go show it off to everyone. And uh, if it's not, work, if people expect, when you go to talk to people about what you're, what you're working on, people expect it to be working right off the bat. No matter at what stage you're at, they just assume it's working. So it's 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 good to either be able to tell people why it's not at the stage where, where they expect it or wait until it is at a, a further stage where you can actually show tech demos and, and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one more question for me, and I think it's, I'm expecting it's something that you've heard before. Um, the word autonomous is scary for some people. You hear you hear concerns about displacement of jobs, especially in, in manufacturing. Is that something that comes up in conversation? How do you respond to someone that says, hey, what about the people who could have jobs making these parts instead of robots? Yeah, actually, surprisingly, we expected this to come up a lot more often than it actually has. I think maybe we've heard maybe one or two people actually talk to us about job losses related to to what we're trying to do. But one of the things we've noticed in this industry, and we found out in the industry, is that a lot, a few shops are are closing down due to a lack of employees. If they they physically can't hire enough people to to run the jobs that they need to run. They're denying orders, canceling contracts. That's because they can't hire enough people to 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 run the the, the machines. And I don't think it's it's not necessarily that there aren't people that want to work in this industry, but it's, it's skill trade industry and skill trades is declining in North America overall. Like people aren't really going into this industry anymore, so they're starting to be more open jobs in this in this space. We, I mean, I think it would be lying if you're saying that some jobs won't be lost, but our, our our goal really isn't to replace the machinists. It's to move them to more valuable uh, positions. So instead of having them stand there and just watch a machine cut for 20 hours like I had to do, have them do things like CAM programming or be more sales focused and talk to clients or do things that a machine can't autonomously do just yet. Yeah, I think that's a I think that's a very pragmatic approach, and I think it also ties back into what you mentioned earlier: is if you can make this more efficient, you can onshore manufacturing again, and and maybe yeah. that has the opposite effect, and you know you're actually bringing more jobs uh, than you're displacing. Yeah, with with our autonomous machine shop, like we don't expect it to be completely unmanned. I don't think we or in terms of safety, we can have it so there's absolutely zero people in the shop. There will have to be probably a few people, uh, supervisors to make sure that a fire doesn't start or something like that. Of course. So it's not like we're completely eliminating machinists from this trade. We're just making it so that machinists can run more machines than they typically can. Yeah, it's a, a, an efficiency play. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Tracy, anything from you before I wrap it up? All right. Yes, I just wanted to say to you, Osfat, that uh, you and I have something in common. And, oh, really? okay. oh yes i really love to play golf oh yeah <laughs> you like being on the golf course just as much as i do you know it's very re- rejuvenating it's something that i love to do just because i need to clear my mind and it sounds like that's something that uh, you get a lot of pleasure doing yeah golf is something i actually started i got into earlier this year and it is is such a calm sport most of the time until you, you hit uh, you miss a ball or you get into the water or something like that but it's it's nice it's a nice way to get your mind off of working because uh, especially when you're at, a, at such an early stage like we are when you have two people on a team you're going to be working a lot and and both my co-founder and I are putting in quite a bit of, of hours and just being able to be both physically active and just play a sport, play a game with with your buddies whenever you have the the time to do so. It's a good way to get your mind off of things and just enjoy life a little bit. 
Yeah, we've had uh, people that we've interviewed in the past and, you know, the feeling is the same, that being out there, get uh, active, being involved in the community is is definitely something uh, we all need in our lives. You two must play a different game of golf than I do because I don't find golf as a stress reliever at all. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I think that's a great place uh, to wrap it up. It's been fantastic learning about Zap Metals and, and we're excited to see how the business grows. Um, of course, we're leaving with more knowledge than we came with and, and I think that's always the goal. Uh, so thank you, Osafat, for sharing your knowledge uh, and your story and, and your journey with, with Zap Metals. Um, and uh, we'll, uh, we'd love to chat with you again later and, and follow up and, and see how things are going. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It was a great time and happy to be on in the future again as we continue to, to grow. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks. We'll be right back after this short break. In two minutes, you can get a tailored list of resources for your venture with the Government of Canada's Business Benefits Finder. Grow your business with this helpful online tool. Head to your favorite search engine and type in Business Benefits Finder or click on the link in the episode notes. We return to the Frontier Entrepreneurship Podcast with co-hosts Braden Kemp and Tracy Morningstar. Tracy, every time we do one of these interviews, I, I realize the world of what we call innovation is driven by people who specialize and commit themselves and really become experts in a niche. What do you think about mechatronics? It's not something I've really had any exposure to. Neither have I. And mechatronics and green engineering is something I've never heard of before. But this young guy, Osafat Khan, I'm going to use his full name because I want to make sure people know who he is because I believe that he's going to be somebody that is cutting edge and part of the new frontier of what Canada is going to be in the future. Yeah, I, I found it really interesting um, how we always hear about automation displacing or removing jobs. And, and I think his angle on it is that we can use things like mechatronics and, and automation to bring jobs back. And, you know, you hear people talking about onshoring jobs in manufacturing, but you don't hear a lot about how people are going to actually do it uh, and and to increase efficiency in, in such a way that it, it becomes economical to manufacture things here in Canada. That, that's a that's a pretty cool angle and, and, you know, it's something I think makes a lot of sense. Yes, and also... You know, my understanding of what he said was, and also more meaningful jobs, um, which is exactly what we all want and how we contribute to the Canadian society is being able to love the job that we're doing. And Osfat definitely loves what he's doing. He's a young individual who is uh, uh, growing a product and with just a small team too. Absolutely. And... Uh... And and you mentioned with meaningful jobs, and we're we're talking about uh, machinists, highly trained, highly skilled people. You know that time can be better spent uh, than just staring at a, a mill waiting for it to do its thing. So, uh, all in all, I, I learned a lot, and uh, and it's always great talking to these folks. I'd like to say thanks again uh, to our guest Osafat Khan from Zap Metals for joining us, to you Tracy, uh, and for everyone taking the time to listen to the Frontier Entrepreneurship Podcast. We can't wait to talk to you all next time. This edition of the Frontier Entrepreneurship Podcast was made possible with the support of FedDev Ontario and the Government of Canada. Special thanks to Victoria Pitchler. The executive producer of Frontier Entrepreneurship is Robert Washburn. I'm John Hayden. To find out more, head to our website, ncfdc.ca. That's ncfdc.ca. Thanks for listening.